I'm John Poole, and uh, I've been Jeff's uncle all of his life, and so I became involved uh, on this the, the day he was arrested because he called and his family called and wanted to know what was going on. And I, I had prior law enforcement experience, and they thought maybe I could help. And so from that day, we got busy and uh, worked on this case, and we're still working on it today. Do you remember what Jeffrey was like in his younger years? He was a typical kid. He played ball. I mean, uh, rode his bike around. I mean, never was a problem kid. I mean, we lived away from here, but we would always see them, and they came to visit us in California, and, and we always had a great time with him. He's always been a loving, caring uh, person, even when he was young. Can you can you uh, talk about like how he was with other you know girls or women growing up and and you know like his personality and characteristics with them and just as you know to attest to his character? I think he always uh, held women in high esteem. I never saw him doing anything derogatory towards women or saying anything about them. Uh, He's the type of person that could even squash a bug hardly. I mean, he doesn't want to harm anybody or hurt anyone's feelings. Can you talk about when you got into the thick of it um, with the, the homicide of Jessica Kern and your experience with the Mayfield PD, the KBI, and the KSP with this case, Jeff's legal battle specifically? Well, I thought once I kind of, uh, our uh, family uh, uh, obtained an attorney and one of the, the, for Jeffrey, and one of the agreements to that is my wife and I would work in the attorney's office and uh, help work on the case. And so we were involved with his attorney on almost a daily basis. And as I got looking at the evidence and, and based on my past experience, or even if somebody just with common sense looked at the evidence, I could see that it was totally messed up. Uh, the case was not investigated right. Mayfield Police Department had an opportunity to do it right, but if you look at the record, they chose somebody that had no experience at all, promoted somebody in the field to investigate a, a murder. What I was saying, the uh, police officer at, at Mayfield that originally was assigned this case, had absolutely no experience. He was a patrol officer and a jailer before that, and for some reason, supervision at Mayfield Police Department promoted him to detective, and evidence was lost at the beginning, never wound up at the station. As far as I know, that was never investigated. Where I work, if you lost evidence, there would have been an investigation to find out where that evidence went and I don't think Mayfield ever did that. And then it went on to the state police, and, and, and that it winds up with somebody else that was just promoted to detective that had limited experience. And then that person, that was Jamie Mills, and then Jamie Mills was terminated, and then detective Sam Steger was assigned to the case. So it's already went through two different groups and now it's coming to Sam Steger who handled the case. There was terrific pressure that I found in, in the records on Mr. Steger to solve the case. And so he went about it and then it winds up uh, the Attorney General's office got involved, a man by the name of Greg Stumbo. And it just so happened at the same time, maybe this doesn't mean anything, but he was running for lieutenant governor and he wanted to res resolve the case. And this was right before the election. And so he had created what was called the Kentucky Bureau of Investigation. And he hired uh, two individuals, neither one had ever investigated a murder, uh, Robert O'Neill, uh, was one of them. He was a narcotics uh, detective with Louisville PD. And Lee Wise, whose wife was the assistant attorney general. And those two 
worked with Steger. And, and if you look at the record, there seemed to be conflict between both organizations on this, which that's never good. There has to be a lead agency, somebody making decisions. So it moves through, it's taken to the grand jury real quickly. And uh, the, the first of the group was indicted and then it just went bad from there. Did you ever suspect or believe that Jeffrey was responsible or capable of what he was being suspected of and charged with at the time and later convicted of? I never did because like uh, I've said many times to people, he can't hardly uh, go to a dead cat or animal. I mean, he, for what the state is saying happened to Jessica, he couldn't, he doesn't have the ability to, to stand that. I mean, he's a kind hearted person. I've never believed that, that he could have been capable of doing any, anything. In the same with Jessica, just what I've learned from her, the different things that she supposedly went along with doesn't fit her character either. So that whole thing never made sense to me and the evidence shows that it's not true. Okay, so this will be a two part question. What convinces you that Jeffrey, Tamara and Quincy are innocent and what do you think about Venetia and Victoria when it comes to innocence or guilt? Well, I'll take the, the, the back part of that first. I've always believed that Venetia knows or was involved somehow w with the murder. Victoria, I don't know that if she's not a kind of a latecomer thinking that she could get some money or something because a lady got involved named Susan Galbert that was trying to be a private detective. And so she really, if you look at the state's a case, she wrote the script for it. There, there's evidence there that she wrote what that they came up with and got the people to, to say. So I think Victoria, it, it, that's how she got involved. Now, I could be totally wrong in that. But Venetia, I believe she was either there, knows what happened, and she tells a different story every time. Uh, she never tells the same thing. And she's always uh, been around her and she's always telling me she's gonna tell me the truth. And then she has some other story. So she's talked to me many times, but she, she's gonna tell me who did it and, and uh, she never does. Now back to the first three, Tamara was pregnant at that time. How, how would she be over, you know, they claim there was an orgy and all those things. Uh, how, how could that possibly be? And then on Quincy, if you look at the phone records where he was staying that night, he's making calls down to Tennessee into the wee hours, and then he gets out to go to town or whatever, I guess it's contested where he was going, in Greg Stark's car, which that was another person that was staying there. And then he gets stopped by the police because he's dumping, well first a jailer stops him thinking he's going to help him uh, get his car started. In, in the end, Quincy winds up getting arrested. Well, if all this happened like the state says, how did Quincy make these phone calls from Chris Drive where he was staying out and do all these things in that short time. It just couldn't happen. And the state kept changing in the uh, Quincy's trial until the testimony was given by a, a, a jailer that Quincy was in jail. He couldn't have done anything, uh, uh, but he supposedly was charged with threatening all of them to get them to lie. And then magically, the state changes that whole thing and nobody questions it, uh, the, the uh, defense attorney or anything. It just doesn't, nothing makes sense. Nothing is credible in the state's case. It all goes back to Susan Galbert's scenarios, which we have copies of it that she wrote, which the state had it. That's how we got it uh, through the discovery. Everything I'm saying came through the state, those investigators had the ability to look at the same thing that we did. I'm gonna give you something to look at or look off of for this next question. I was 
was going to give you the, the evidence list of everything that went missing, but well, that might be over here. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, so can you speak about the, um, the, the, I'd say the pieces of evidence that were pertinent to the case that went missing? Well, I don't know if this one has. It has 52 pieces of evidence, I believe. Yeah, but, but this is what they had. The, the missing part wouldn't be on here. Well, the, the hairs and there's hairs and. Um, yes, and in, in fact, uh, there was a motion made in, at Quincy's trial, or even maybe before by uh, uh, Mark Bryant, the attorney, to get the DNA tested on that hair, and Judge Stark refused to do that. Which that might have that hair is still, as far as I know, in evidence with the state. Did he give a, Did he give a reason as to why he didn't want to test it? I didn't see anything. I think Stark was was new as a judge in this, and uh, because when we did the Austin Leach trial, which was before Stark, we used the evidence that we had prepared for Quincy and uh, for uh, Jeffrey, uh, and, and Quincy's attorney could have had anything that we wanted. I believe his attorney was so sick. In fact, the judge, if you look at the court tapes, asked him, his name was Vince Eustace, if he was well enough to carry on. And, and uh, he actually was sleeping over there and so forth, and that was never corrected. And uh, we had the evidence to impeach Rosie Christ with a video tape or video DVD that where she said she'd lied on Jeff. We couldn't get Quincy's attorney to play that and impeach her, although he brought her back as a uh, witness uh, for the defense instead of trying to uh, impeach her when she was lying, and, and she admitted she was lying, and then the state prosecutes her for perjury. So she got sham uh, messed up all the way around when she did try, but why not, why would you not, the help that I offered and I sat in that courtroom, why wouldn't you take that to, to help your client? Can you talk about what's been said over the years of what happened and can you also point out the holes in the, you know, stories and statements of those that have, uh, said them over the years that's actually led to the convictions of the five? Well, I think how there's two reasons I think this moved through. One, Joe and his family, which they had ever right, they were not treated right, nothing was investigated. They were trying to put pressure on just to get it done right. Not, and Joe said this many times, not just to convict somebody to, to quieten things down. So they had that going. You have a guy that's attorney general that created his private police force, which has been disbanded as soon as he got out, hires people that aren't even qualified to investigate the case. And then you've got Susan Galbraith, who's since deceased, putting all these stories going around with the state police, doing joint investigations with them, which I don't know of a police agency that would ever allow that. But they did. So, I mean, there were so many things. And then even back to the original investigation, evidence missing. Nobody ever followed up on that. Uh, the BP station where the lady said uh, that gas w was purchased in there, wasn't by Quincy Cross, and, and, and it was by the person that that was charged in the original Lolo Saxton. What happened? You know, why didn't wasn't that followed up on? I mean, it just was a shoddy investigation, uh, pushed by wanting to to convict somebody, and also pushed by an individual that wanted to get she thought a ten thousand dollar reward, and for 
a movie that she was doing with a guy named Tom Mangold from England, which we have receipts of the money that she got in an advance on that. So her motivation was to convict somebody. And, and she's the one that cranked it into Jeffrey Burton by she was using MySpace at that time. That was one of those social media things. That's how all that went on. That was all Susan Galbert. Can you talk about the weapons that's changed over time? Ratchet, baseball bat, belt, and you know, talk about the holes you know, in those, those stories or statements? Well, the thing that's always amazed me, uh, supposedly Rosie Christ said that uh, the weapon would be out by her old trailer in Ballard County. But also, there was a dump out there right by the trailer where they threw old construction debris and other things. And all before the police go out and, and search that, and all, they can't find a bat or anything like that, but they do find a ratchet. And they set that ratchet aside, and it sets for a day or so, nobody mentions anything. And then all of a sudden, Wise, O'Neill, and Steger come up with a story and get people to say that she was struck with a ratchet that goes click, click, click. Well, you know a ratchet don't do anything unless you're working it as a tool. So if you're hitting somebody, it doesn't do that. So those witnesses don't even know what a ratchet does. So every time the state found something that, that they couldn't find the bat, it changed to a ratchet. And, and I mean, it's just thing after thing like that. Like I said earlier, when Quincy Cross supposed to have this meeting and threatened all of them and had a gun, the jailer, I think it was Christian County, gets up and testified, he was in jail. And then magically, I believe it was uh, Victoria, either Victoria or Venetia, testi testifies it was Jeffrey. How, how did that change? Why was that not questioned in there. But so, I mean, we can go over all the different things, but it just, like I said, somebody just with common sense looks at this, knows that it's wrong. Why do you think the stories kept changing? Well, one of the things they always tell that story, if you tell a lie, you can't ever remember uh, what you said. And, and I'm sure with that group, they lie continuously so they couldn't remember. And if you look at when they're interviewing uh, those folks, when I work the police department, if I'm interviewing you, we have to have the camera on me and you so they can see I'm not got a gun on you or, or whatever. Well, those, it's always with Wise and O'Neill, uh, there are some that Steger has where you can see, but most of them, it, it's just the person that's giving the, te uh, the statements. So they turn the, the camera off when something wasn't going along right, and then all magically that comes back on again, and then they're telling the story that the state wants. Well, I know that Jeffrey's innocent. Uh, I, I've spent hours on this and I know from my experience that even I've shown this to I don't know how many retired police officers they say it's totally wrong uh, nothing was done right in this and even uh, the judge that handled this the first time Darde said that this is one of the most screwed up cases that he's ever seen in his life and so there you go uh, what I would say to the Currens and what I've said to, to them all along is, yes, I want to help Jeffrey and the others, but I want to help them even more because of all the ones in this thing, they've had the worst treatment. You imagine living with that? And then I can't even imagine as a police officer going to the Currens and say, well, we've got this figured out. You've got to believe this, this, and not tell them the truth. They, you know, Sam Steger and, and Wise and O'Neill are not dumb people. They have to know that this story is not the truth. And they owe that to the Kearns. But unfortunately, you'll see it's all the time in the media that when 
we make a mistake in police work that it's hard to admit that. You'll see in cases where they have found DNA that actually exonerates the person that spent 20 something years, the state will still fight to try to keep them in jail because they don't want to admit they made a mistake. And if we're not ethical in law enforcement, we have nothing. Where I work, the chief of police, and I did a lot of the background investigations for the new hires, and the one thing he would always tell them when he was deciding to hire them or not, you might wreck the car, you might do this wrong or this, but if one thing I catch you doing, you're gonna get fired, and that's lying. And ethics means everything. And in this case, there's been a lot of lying on the police side, or, or they have no common sense at all if, if they think the truth is here. And there's certainly all kinds of lying on their, all their witnesses. That's all I have to say.